Okay, good morning everyone. And we are holding over here in a new Tehillim today. It's number Nun Beis 52. And the Hagdam, the introduction of this Tehillim, which is very important to understand, is a Maise, is an event which took place in Tanakh, in Sefer Shmuel. And we have learned throughout this uh, experience of Tehillim that David Melech had a father-in-law. And his father-in-law, his father-in-law's name cannot hear. Maybe I should take myself off a mute. Can you hear now? Yes. Great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, it's nice to know someone's listening. Now, we're, we're holding over here in Tehillim Nunbeis, number 52. And the introduction to this Tehillim is the background story to understand what is going on over here when David HaMelech is talking. And this is a Maisa, which took place in Sefer Shmuel. And the story is that David HaMelech's father-in-law, who was Shaul HaMelech, King Saul, who was very jealous of his son-in-law, David HaMelech, and constantly causes him problems and issues in his life, had the following story. David HaMelech was being chased down by his father-in-law, and he's fleeing like a, a beggar because of the, the jealous wrath of his father-in-law, Shaul. He's starving, he's unarmed, he's in a very bad situation, and he comes to the city of Noiv. The city of Noiv was known as the ear, the city of Kohanim, of the, of the priests. And he comes there and he meets Achimelech. Achimelech is one of the priests, he's also one of the great servants of Shaul HaMelech. And he sees David, and he sees him starving, and he sees him without his sword. And David asks him, can you help me? I'm, 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 I, I need help. So now Achimelech assumed, rightfully so, that David HaMelech was on a mission from his father-in-law, Shaul HaMelech, King Saul. And he assumed that he was lacking food, he was lacking a sword. So he said, no problem, I'll supply you with it. So he gives him food, and he sustains him. He gives him a sword because David Amal can't go fight people for his father-in-law if he doesn't have his sword. And at that time, Doeg Ha'adoimi, as, we'll as we'll see, happened to have been in the city of Naif at the time, and he saw what's going on. Now, Doeg Ha'adoimi, who was one of the most uh, prized advisors to Shalom Melech, easily could have seen what was going on realized that David Melech was in bad shape, not that he's fighting against his father-in-law, but that he is starving and he's hungry and he has no protection for himself, so he asked for a sword. And he could have just left it, he could have left it at that. However, David Melech, uh, however, Doeg HaDoimi did not do that. Instead, he ends up going and being malsh, and he ends up slandering David Melech against his father-in-law, Shal HaMelech, and the events of, that take, transpire afterwards is that the entire city of Naiv, which was a, c- a city of priests, ends up getting wiped out, ends up getting wiped out by a command of Shaul, which Doeg Adoimi himself ends up carrying out. So it's a very tragic story. And the point of the story, as we're going to see, is that when you have a chance, to be dan lechav schus, to judge somebody favorably, when you have a chance to say over things in just the facts, the way that they are, and not throw in your own commentary and your own ideas and your own slant on things, which is going to be construed as Lashon Hara, then a person has to be extremely and exceedingly careful in the words that come out of the mouth, mouth and the things that they say. And as we will see that David HaMelech over here is going to bespeak the horrors and the tragedies which took place and try to encourage people to make sure that they end up using their words and their speech in the right way and not in the wrong way over here. This is called a maskil. A maskil over here, the way that the Mepharshim explain it is that this is a tefillah of instruction that David HaMelech is giving over. Meaning since that a great mistake was made over here, he wants people to get instruction to understand how they are supposed to do things. David HaMelech is in a pickle, as we would say. 
He's running from his father-in-law. He's got a, a difficult situation that he's in. Achimelech, one of the Kahanim, gives him his bread, gives him a sword. And it was nothing more than innocent what he was asking for. Yet at the end of the day, Doiga Doimi goes and he destroys everything at this point, and there is a, a great deaths that are incurred as a result. So David Amalekh is saying over here, Lam Natseach, Maskil the David. Let the lesson that I'm about to teach you over here in this Tehillim, let you learn from it as an instruction of what you're supposed to do. So it says over here in verse 2, Bevoi Doiga Doimi. When Doiga Doimi came, the Yaged the Shaul, and he told Shaul what he saw. The Yoimer line, he told him, Ba David al Beis Achimelech. He said, David came to Beis Achimelech, to the house of Achimelech. Now, who was Doyek? So Rav Hirsch points out over here that he was one of the most respected servants of Shaul. And Chazal understand that he was a great Talmud Chacham, he was a very great person. And all, and, but when he watches Achimelech give David the bread and the sword, he decides to go and report the, the, this matter to Shaul HaMelech in a whole different way. And he made it look like that Achimelech was, was knew that David and Shaul were not really getting along. And he made it look like that Achimelech was giving bread and sword to David so that he should be able to go and fight against the king if he so, cho- if he so cho- cho- uh, chose to. Now really what was David doing? He was running away. And he was running off again, as we see many, many times throughout the Hillim. David HaMelech is always on the run. He's got problems on all sides of him. He never has respite. He never is understood. His own father-in-law is chasing after him and wants to kill him. So David is running. Not coming to start up with Shaul Melech, not starting to fight him, nothing like that. He's just running. But Daig Adam, he makes it look like that Achimelech was like rebellious against the king. And as a result of that, the, the, next, the rest of the story ensues. Matis Halil Bera Hagibar Chesed Keo Kolayoim. He says, why do you boast yourself of evil like you're a hero because you're telling the king what David is doing? The, you should know that the chesed keel kol ayoyim, the tremendous loving kindness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that is what is going to endure all day long. Meaning you are saying evil, you are saying Lashon Hara, you are slandering what is going on over here, However, you're going to try to intimidate people and do all these things, but you have to know that at the end of the day, someone that relies upon, as we'll see, someone who relies upon the chesed of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that chesed is going to last all day long. And therefore, the chesed of Hashem will outlive whatever vengeance you have. So Rav Gamliel Rabbanovich writes over here the following. He says, Hine yadua misapim akadoshim. The, the holy people say, Ki ayidei tzedaka u'gimilas chasadim yuchal adam masakin es pigamav. If a person is involved in sedaka, kindness, or charity, and chesed and kindness, they're able to repair any pigamim, any blemishes that they have in themselves. The ayidei kein lizchais namadregos nizgavais, through tzedaka and chesed they can reach very high levels. Now, maybe we can understand what it says in this verse. David is telling Daiga Adomi, why are you saying slander? You think that you're being a hero over here. You're lying on behalf of the king of King Shaul Melech over here. You're making things bad. But you should know, Chesed Kael Kolayon. The kindness of God, that will exist all day long. So he says like this, Hamisnag Bemidas Chesed, somebody who lives a life of chesed, he will merit to have HaKadosh Baruch in his life all day long. He will cling to HaKadosh Baruch without any stop, nothing will get in the way. Like it says in the verse earlier, in the in Tehillim, when I place HaKadosh Baruch in front of me constantly, I'm connected with Hashem. So David HaMelech is telling over here, you're trying to undermine me. You're trying to create problems. 
But someone who lives a life of chesed, someone who relies upon HaKadosh Baruch Hu's chesed, such a person will be connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu all day long. So whatever you do, says David, you're not going to get me. You're not going to destroy me, and you're not going to bring me down. Because I am connected with the Rebbein Yishayim. Havayis tach shayv l'shaynecha kesa'ar. Your, your tongue is like a, like a knife. Malutash oyserimiyah. And it's like a knife that's ground too sharp, and it's working in a deceitful way. Says Rav Hirsch, your tongue is like a knife that is ground too sharp, and you want to use it to injure other people. However, you must be extremely careful, because the same mouth, the same tongue that you want to use to destroy others, it could be the thing that is going to end up cutting your own hand as well. Meaning, you're trying to get me, says David HaMelech, but you're the one that's going, to be get, that's going to be got in the end. As we know that a person who plans to do evil and tries to do evil, at the end of the day, they are the ones that are only going to end up hurting themselves. And says David HaMelech, you're not going to have any bearing on me at all. Ahavtara mitayv, you loved evil over good, and you decided to speak falsehood rather than speaking honestly. Says Rav Hirsch, you took an opportunity which you could have done something good. You could have just left me alone. I'm fleeing from Shaul Melech. He's chasing after me. I don't know what he has against me, says David. So I'm hungry. I don't have any weapons to go into the wilderness with. And I ask Achimelech for a little bit of help. You could have left it alone and turned the other way and not done anything. Instead, you decided to turn something that was innocent and you turned it into evil. You took your tongue, which could have spoken good or could have just been quiet. Instead, it got into sheker, into falsehood. And therefore, now this entire mess which has taken place has transpired. Meaning, because that you decided to open your mouth and you spoke falsely, and wrongly, and sheker, and deceitful, deceitful against me, and you told lies to Shaul HaMelech, and you, you ended up slandering Achimelech, who was innocently giving me what he did, you created such a terror, such a horrible thing as a result. However, a hafta called Div, Divrei Bala, since you're, you are a you're friend that devours words, l'shoin mirma, and your tongue is a tongue of deceit. So this is six and seven together. Gam kel yitatzcha l'netzach. HaKadosh Baruch is going to break you forever. Yachtecha v'yisachacha. He's going to send you away and he's going to remove you. Me'ayo from every tent. V'shashecha me'eretz chayim sela. And he's going to uproot you from the land of life. So again, before we see the commentary, but but in the simple pshat over here is, is that Achimelech thought that what he's doing is something that's going to be beneficial in the world of Shalom Melech. But nobody ever benefits from speaking Lashon Hara. Even if you think that when you're saying the falsehood or you're saying the Lashon Hara or you're saying these things that are deceitful, it will benefit somebody. Nobody's ever, there's never going to be a true benefit. Because as he tells him the following, your acts against me and Achimelech before Shaul, you've shown us what a dangerous person you really are. And you've proven that you like to use your words to bring down disaster upon innocent people. And in general, you delight in employing your gift of speech for fraud and deceit. And therefore, a person like you represents something that is really terrible in the eyes of Hashem, and you are trying to remove people from their happiness here in this world. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks at you as an evil influence. And therefore, He will not allow you to grow. He will not allow you to flourish. He will not allow you to exist. And rather, what's going to happen is you, that are trying to cut down the world around you, you're the one that is going to end up being cut down instead. So if you make yourself into a person that creates a very big doubt in the eyes of Hashem of who you really are. 
If you're a person who gravitates towards the negativity, you gravitate towards the evil, you gravitate towards doing things that can bring disaster upon others, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, well, you're, you are an impediment into the world and the life of other people. You are hurting other people's striving for happiness and for growth and for goodness. And therefore, at the end of the life, you, at the end of the day, you are the one that is going to end up being uprooted from that which you have done. V'yiru tzadikim, v'yiru v'ala yishako. And the righteous will see you, and they will be afraid at first, because you're a frightening person. However, at the end, they're going to laugh about this person. So what, is, what does it mean over here that the righteous will see such a man like Doeg, and Doeg, and they will end up being afraid? So he says that since Chazal understand that Doeg Adami was a Tamil Chachim, he was really, a, he was a righteous person in his own right, and nevertheless with all of the Torah that he had, he was able to sink to such a low place. That means that nobody could ever really trust themselves. No matter how great a person is, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong ruach of shtus, of of foolishness that blows into their head, with the wrong opportunities that are presented in front of them, anybody, no matter how great they are, could end up making a mistake. So the tzaddikim are not afraid of doyge doymi. Not that they're afraid that he's going to do something to them, but they are afraid that as they watch his downfall and they watch his story unfold in front of their eyes, that means that just as he sunk to this low moral level, and he went to a place <coughs> that he should not have gone to, that means any man of tzidkos of righteousness, it is quite possible that they could end up sinking to the same level as well. And therefore, all of the righteous take heed and warning over here, and they are concerned that maybe if we don't guard ourselves and watch ourselves, the same thing can happen to them. He says that Sadiqim will remember that just like the Torah cannot protect Doege Adoimi, the, but, but the reason that it did not protect him is because it shows that from his beginning, although that he was a Talmud Chacham, they understand that from the beginning he was a person that had evil and he was filled with arrogance and, and the like. So therefore, at the end of the Pasuk it says, that they will, Yishaku, they will laugh at him. Why are they laughing? Because the truth of the matter is, is that Torah really should protect a person. If a person learns, and a person is sincere, and a person in, imbibes the Torah, they, the Torah envelops them, so then the Torah should have the kayach, the ability to be a mugging, to be a shield that is going to protect them from making major mistakes in their life. However, if a person is arrogant, if a person has the seeds of evil that are in them, and even with all the Torah, they find themselves still misbehaving, so then the Torah is not going to protect them. So the tzaddikim on one hand are frightful, and their fear is that just like Daigeh Adami made a mistake, we could also make a mistake. But then they realize, what was the downfall of Daigeh, the arrogance that got in the way of the Torah being able to protect him is what ended up hurting him. So therefore, any person who is a tzaddik, any person that is filled with the ruach, the spirit of Torah, as long as the humility is there in its place and they are not too overconfident of themselves, then in fact the Torah itself will be a shield that will be able to protect them from making major mistakes in their life. He says, Behold that this man did not let Hashem be the source of his strength. Rather, he trusted in his wealth. He let him be strong by the means of what he has devised. What does that mean? Says, says, um, says, Rav Hirsch over here, this, uh, uh, again, based on these last ideas that we said, that if, if you're a Torah scholar, so then you have to realize that you're getting your strength from the source of the Torah itself. 
The source of the Torah itself is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. A person who learns Torah is supposed to be a humble human being because the more that one learns, the more one realizes they don't know anything. The more that one probes the depths, the depths of the wisdom of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the more they realize how much there is really out there. Someone who learns Torah in that way and keeps Torah in that way, they are supposed to realize that the source of all of their strength is the Rebbein HaShayim. Daigah Adaymi, instead of trusting in Hashem, he trusted in himself. He trusted in his wealth, he trusted in his smarts, he trusted in his brains, and he did not humble himself and submit himself before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. As a result of that, therein lies the downfall that he ended up falling into, because the Torah cannot protect such a person. Many times people will be engaged in Torah study, they will be engaged in shiurim, in classes, they will hear things and they will see things and they will understand things, but they will tell you that, I don't know, the Torah just doesn't talk to me. I don't get it, I don't understand it, it's not changing my life. And the reason that the Torah doesn't change the life of a person is because a person is not willing to change their life. If a person would be willing to accept the sovereignty of HaKadosh Baruch and they're willing to accept the greatness and the Kedusha of the Torah, then it's obvious that the Torah is going to have an impact and change their life. We just had over, over Pesach break, many boys that came back from yeshiva, these boys were wandering the streets of Tarzana not many years ago. These are boys that you'd find them, you know, sitting in shul. If they came to shul on their iPhones doing who knows what. And today they're sitting and they were learning hours and hours on end. They were smiling. They were pure. They were shining like a light. What happened to them? What happened to them was, is that they embraced the Torah. And they realized that the Torah could change their life. And they realized that yeshiva could change their life, and the rebbeim could change their life, and being submissive and being humble before our Kodesh Baruch Hu will change their life, and it ends up opening them up to a whole new world of Torah. On the other hand, you could have people who rely upon themselves, and they detach from Torah, they detach from our Kodesh Baruch Hu, they detach from the emes of this world, and then they're all on their own. And once a person goes on their own, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, that's it, you don't want me? So fine, so you're on your own. You don't have my protection. You don't have my bracha. You don't have my siyat de shemaya. You don't have my care. You don't have my concern. It's not the same anymore. And therefore, Dayaga Daimi was the one who ended up relying upon himself and his strength and his riches and everything. Else. Instead of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you learn and you learn and you learn and you learn. But what's it worth? It's, all, it's almost says David HaMelech, it's almost worthless in the eyes of Hashem. Va'ani, but for me, says David, Kezayis Ra'anan, I am like this evergreen olive, Beves Elohim, in the house of Elohim. What's a green olive? A green olive is an olive that's ripened all the time. It doesn't wither, it doesn't shrivel, it doesn't turn brown. It's like a ripened olive, and olive is always the sign of the chachma, the wisdom, because olive, the oil that was put into the menorah, in the base hamigdash, that's the sign of the wisdom of Torah. David HaMelech says, I'm not like you. I am like a, an olive that is constantly ra'anan, that's constantly green and ripened. And because of what? Because betachdi, because I trust in the Rebbein Shailam. Betachdi bechesed elakim oilam vayad. I trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's mercy constantly. Not like you. Because of my connection to Torah, because of my connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because of my connection to Ruchnius, therefore I'm sitting in the house of, the, of Hashem all of the time. I might not, as Rav Hirsch points out over here, I might not have any place to go in this world because I'm always on the run. I'm being chased down every single day in my life. And now I've got my father-in-law chasing me once again and you, you're chasing after me because you're trying to, to say that I did something that I didn't do. Nevertheless, 
in the base Elohim, in the house of Hashem, which again we learned previously in Tehillim, base Elohim, the house of Hashem, doesn't mean just the base Amigdash. There was no base Amigdash when David Amalek was alive. It doesn't only mean the Mishkan, it doesn't only mean the tabernacle. Base Elohim is anywhere, like Rav Hirsch explained, anywhere that I go in my life, I can be standing with Hashem before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the base Elohim could be in the base Amidrash. It could be in my car, it could be in my house, it could be while I'm waiting online at the bank and everybody else is getting agitated because it takes three and a half minutes to get to the teller and I'm standing there with patience. Wherever I am, it could be Beis Elohim. Says David HaMelech, I live in the Beis Elohim. Yeah, I'm wandering, I don't have food, I don't have a sword, I have nothing, but I live in the house of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Because I trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's mercy. And he says, that nobody could deprive me of, my, of the spirit that I have inside of me that is always growing upwards towards Hashem. Unlike you, Dayek, who put your trust in wealth, I put my trust in the mercy of the Rebbeinu Shailam. And therefore, I'm never forsaken all of the days of my life. No matter who wants to get me, I, am not gonna be, I will not be brought down as a result of that. Says the Malbim on this Pasuk over here, I trusted in the kindness of Hashem forever. Because goodness that a person will receive because of their, their personal actions, or their merits, Einoi batuach shiyasmi la'olam. They can never be guaranteed that he will be rewarded constantly for the good deeds that they do in this world. Why? Ki ishtana bi ishtana is Because whatever HaKadosh Baruch is going to give me as a reward changes based upon the ever-changing actions that I do in this world. Meaning, it could be today I'm a tzaddik. It could be tomorrow I'm not such a tzaddik. It could be right now I'm davening and I'm talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and when I finish davening, my phone rings and I start talking Lashonar to somebody else. So my actions are very, um, it, my actions are very unsettled and very insecure. And therefore it's impossible, says David HaMelech, that I could trust that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to constantly reward me for my deeds. However, the goodness that comes from the chesed, from the acts of kindness of that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does, Shalai api amishpat, not because I deserve or I don't deserve, kifi amaisim taivim, or according to the good deeds that I've done, no, it's all chesed Hashem, hu yela'oylam ki chesed Hashem lo yishtane. That will come constantly because the chesed of Hashem is something that never changes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't change his essence. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't change who he is. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the master of chesed. That is something that is constant. And therefore, when David HaMelech became the king, Shaul was out of the picture, and David became the king over Klal Yisrael, that was all mitzah chesed, that was all on the side of chesed, the act of, of kindness that he received. So David is saying over here, I can't rely upon myself because I'm someone that will change. I don't, I don't know if I'm always going to do the right thing. Maybe I'll do the wrong thing. If I do the right thing, I deserve reward. If I do the wrong thing, I deserve punishment. So I can't rely upon my actions. But one thing I could rely upon, that's your chesed, Hashem. Your chesed is eternal. Your chesed is constant. Your chesed is something that I don't have to worry about. It's always going to be there. And since I trust in your chesed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that is why you are going to take care of me and make sure that I have what I need. Says Rav Gamliel Rabbanovich on this Pasuk, he says like this, If a person places themselves in the house of Hashem, like this evergreen olive, it's fresh, it's ripe all the time. And they work hard in learning and in davening, and serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and through all of that, you will merit to reach the level of bitachin. 
Bitach doesn't come just magically by itself. Trusting in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you have to do something to acquire your trust in Hashem. If you learn, and you daven, and you serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're going to be zeicha, you will merit to trust in Hashem. Because you, you trust in something that you, that you have a connection to. You trust in something that you, that you see works. When you get on a plane and you fly across the world, you're not nervous the whole plane, right? Because you flew on a plane a thousand times already. And you didn't hear about a crash any other day, God forbid. You know that the plane, 99.9% of the time, is going to make it to its destination. So it's tangible. It's real. There's a pilot. There's a, a crew. There's other people on the plane. They also trust that the plane is going to make it there. So it's, it's real. It's tangible. So therefore you trust in it. When HaKadosh Baruch becomes tangible to you, when he becomes real to you, then you'll trust in Hashem as well. How does HaKadosh Baruch become real? There's three ways, he says. Number one, it's Torah. Torah is the Das Elokiz HaKadosh Baruch Hu's mind. It's Hashem talking to us. Number two, there's Tefillah, there is prayer, where we're talking to Hashem, establishing and creating and solidifying the relationship that we have with the Rebbein Hashem. And then there's Avodis Hashem, serving Hashem. Who are you serving? You're serving Hashem. So the more that you do these things, you will then merit to come to a level of reality where you trust in the Rebbe Nishayim. Elad Shetzarech Leidu, you have to know, the Chesed Al Kim Oylem Vayed, the Chesed of Hashem is forever. Ki Af Liacha Kol Yigiyasa Bavodis Hashem, even after you work so hard, learning and davening and serving Hashem. Nevertheless, ain b'koychem l'mu'uma, you still have no strength or abilities all on your own. U'bechidai l'skois l'midas ha'bitochen ar hu nitzrach l'chesed Hashem. Even after all your hard work, you're establishing the relationship that you have with HaKadosh Baruch, it's becoming more and more real, more and more tangible in your eyes. Nevertheless, if HaKadosh Baruch is chesed, would not be upon you, meaning HaKadosh Baruch Hu, would not help you reach that level of bitachin where you can trust in Him, it would never happen by itself. And through the hard work, you worked hard, you have to do your shtadlis, your effort down here, but nevertheless, the effort is only the effort that we do. Whether or not you're going to reach the level of really trusting in HaKadosh Baruch or not, you still need Hashem to send it your way. So we try... We make efforts, we do the best that we possibly can, we learn, we daven, we serve our Kodesh Baruch Hu, we get involved in chasadim, we talk about Hashem, all the things, but if it's going to click in your mind that there's a master of the world that's watching over us, and he's involved with everything that we do, and he cares about us, and he loves us, and he wants only what's best for us, and he would never do bad, and chule v'chule, so on and so forth, all of these ideas and ideals and ashkafa that we're living with, in order for it to click in in the right way, you need HaKadosh Baruch Hu's chesed. You need his kindness to be able to establish that within. And he quotes over here from the Mesil Sisharim, from the Path of the Just, that towards the very end of the Sefer, he gets into the Midah of Kedusha, of holiness. Very apropos, we had this last week's Parsha, Kedushim Tiyu, I'm not sure that anybody knows anymore what Kedusha is in our lifetime. Hey, for the Tzadikim, they understand. But Kedusha is a high, high level that the Ramchal speaks about, of how a person is detaching themselves from the physical world and clinging more and more and more to Hashem. But he writes a fascinating thing. The Amnam Lefishi Yavshel Adam Shiyasimes who has atzma b'matzav azeh, ki kovedu mimenu. It's impossible, says the Ramchal, for a person to reach the zenith of kedusha of holiness, because a person is much heavier than holiness. Ki saif saif chaymu hu basav At the end of the day, I have a body, and my body is flesh and blood. Kedusha by its definition means separate from the physical world. So at the end of the day, no matter, even though if you're on the ladder of spirituality, according to the Mesil Sisharim, you're already like almost on the top rung. Your body you should have left a long time ago. Nevertheless, says the Ramchal, no, 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 your body's still right there. And therefore, Kedusha is a very hard thing for a person to attain. Al-Kain Amartisha Seif HaKedusha Matana. 
At the end of the day, when you will become a holy person, HaKadosh Baruch is giving to you as a matana, as a gift. Ki whatever you could do, hu you have to work hard and chase after coming to the emes, coming to the truth. And you have to work to try to understand the Kedusha, the holiness in your actions and the like. But at the end of the day, says the Ramchal, the one that's going to direct you in the proper path so that you can attain Kedusha, it's all HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing that. The Yishul of Kedushasai, Hashem will then bring His holiness down upon you. The Yakdishayu and He'll sanctify you. The Azyatzliach beyond the Izeha Dava, then you'll succeed. She Yuchal, the Yois Bedvekus, Azei Mo Yisbarach, but Timidius, when you reach the level of holiness, you can cling to our Kodesh Baruch constantly. Kimasha Teva Mo Neemi Menu, because even though your physical nature will hold you back from being able to accomplish that, Yazreli Yisbarach, we see Yitain Lai Hashem is going to help you. And He's going to bring you along. Like it says in Tehillim, La Yimna Taib La Hoichim Betamim, those that go in the path of purity, Hashem will not hold back His goodness from you. So says the Mesil Sisharim, and this is what we're saying over here as well, that yes, we try, and yes, we, we learn, and we daven, and we serve our Kodesh Baruch Hu. And yes, we try to stay fresh and we try to reach all these high levels. But at the end of the day, it's a matan, it's a gift that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us. When you reach a level of bitachin in your life where you really feel the presence of Hashem and you're willing to go out on a limb for HaKadosh Baruch Hu and do things that maybe a week ago, a year ago, two years ago, you'd never do such a thing. But you reach the level now, there's a, a comfort zone that you are together with HaKadosh Baruch Where did you get that from? You worked hard? Yes. But at the end of the day, even with all the hard work, Hashem is the one that's giving you that relationship as a matana, as a gift. Remember, Hashem is the master of the universe. He's coming down to billions of worlds to get down over here to create and forge the relationship together with us. Who, who does, who makes more? We do all of our effort, but HaKadosh Baruch is the one that brings it home. And then it says over here, in the final verse, I will thank you forever, for what you have done, Hashem. I hope and I wait for your name, because it is good for, you, for those that are the pious and devoted ones. And he says like this, and this is the classic Pasik of Tehillim that we've seen from David Amel, because he says it again and again and again. And that is, I'm sure that the present affliction that I'm going to, going through right now, which again, running from my father-in-law, out in the wilderness, no food, no weapons, I'm once again misunderstood, and I have people chasing down after me, I have no rest, nothing. However, I know, HaKadosh Baruch that whatever you do, it's all for the best. And you don't make any mistakes. And if I'm going through this once again, it's for my own good. And therefore, I will, have, I will yet have cause to thank you forever for having stricken me with it. Meaning, I appreciate the challenges that you are putting me through, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I appreciate the hardship that I am in. I appreciate that my father-in-law hates my guts and he wants to kill me and destroy me. I appreciate that the Doege Doimi did this, this misjustice over here and it, it brought about horrific results as a result. Why? Because I know that everything that you have stricken me with is only for my benefit. And therefore, even as your name, which is here, it's, it's the name of Hashem, which is the Midas Harachamim, it's the Mida of mercy, it is, it is you, HaKadosh Baruch who is good forever. I trust that I will see it prove itself as such to me and to all of those who dedicate themselves to you in selfless love. Meaning, I have no doubt that what you have done for me is exactly what it is that I need. 
I have no doubt that what you are doing in my life, as painful as it might be and as uncertain as I am, I know that you would never do something that is bad for me. And therefore, I will praise you forever, which means even right now, while I'm going through it. Man, David Amalek is constantly on the run, and he's always singing to our Kodesh Baruch Hu. Praises and songs and to heal him to the Rebbe Nishlam. Why? Because I know that this is all part of the process that I need to go to in order to be able to reach a greater level in my impersonal Avedis Hashem. There's a, a question that the Sefer Achinuch asks, or the unspoken question that he asked on last week's Parsha, Parsha's Kedoshim. There's a slew of mitzvahs which are very hard for the emotional person to understand. It says one mitzvah, you cannot hate your brother in your heart. Then it says, um, you cannot take revenge against someone who wronged you. You can't bear a grudge against somebody who did wrong to you. And the Sev El Chinuch really is dealing with, well, how can you command a person to not hate another Jew in their hearts if this other Jew did destructive things to me? He embarrassed me in public. He shamed me. He stole $100,000 out of my account. He, he ruined this one. He ruined... How can I not hate that person? How can I not bear a grudge against a person that did something so terrible to me and embarrassed me? I'm the laughing stock of everybody in the room wherever I go. How can I not bear a grudge? I'm a, I'm a human being. I'm busted with them. I'm flesh and blood. I've got an emotional world. I can maybe not... Uh, not hurt the person, I could maybe not slash his tires, nevertheless, how can you ask me to rip out of my heart any emotional feelings of negativity that I have towards this person? So the Sefer Chinuch answers the following. And he says, we're mamini, we believe in Hashem, correct? And, and part of our belief is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Never bring that. That uh, the part of our belief is that nobody is allowed to do anything to us in our lives, unless Hakadosh Baruch Hu has decreed that such a thing should happen. There is no one that will do good for us unless Hakadosh Baruch Hu has decreed we deserve that good, and there is no one that will do bad to us unless Hakadosh Baruch Hu has decreed that that bad is supposed to happen. Says the Sefer Chinuch, why would HaKadosh Baruch want bad to happen to a person? So he says, don't point the finger at others. Rather, we know the world exists in a realm of midah k'neged midah, measure for measure. And therefore, if I have done something wrong between me, maybe others, or between me and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I have sinned. HaKadosh Baruch Hu must bring me a kapara, an atonement for the sin that I have committed. Either he's going to wait till the world to come where it's going to get pretty hot down there, or he's going to bring the atonement here in this world. And therefore, sometimes HaKadosh Baruch Hu will allow, or he will send a messenger in the guise of a human being to be the person that's going to bring about the atonement in my life. So if somebody does wrong to me, somebody does bad to me, says the Sefer Chinuch, don't get angry at him. You should examine yourself and see what is it that I have done wrong that I deserve that this catastrophe or this difficulty or this sorrow, this pain has come my way. So instead of taking it out on the person, hating them in your heart, taking revenge, bearing a grudge against them, no, 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 no. Chazal tell us if a person sees Yisur and Baal Olam, they see things that are coming upon them that are suffering or difficulty, examine your deeds. And the truth of the matter is, a person will not have to look very far in their actions and their deeds to find something that they have done wrong, probably from the time that they woke up until right now, that they deserve some kind of an atonement and they need something in this world. And therefore, David Amel is saying a similar idea over here. And that is, if I'm on the run and I'm being chased, and I'm having a hard life. So then I know the reason is not because, uh, not because I'm undeserved and there's mean people in the world, 
But Rabbi HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everything that's happening in my life is coming from you. And you want this because this is the best thing in my life. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's only going to cleanse me and bring me closer. And a person who thinks like that doesn't get angry, doesn't despair, doesn't get despondent, doesn't worry, doesn't get frustrated with the things that are going on in his life. On the other hand, he looks at everything as an opportunity that HaKadosh Baruch is sending me in order to purify, sanctify, cleanse myself of the misdeeds and the mistakes that I've made, and ultimately bring me closer to Hashem. So it's not a punishment, actually a chesed that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings challenges into a person's life, it's all because HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us and He cares about us, and He's being mischasted, He's doing kindness, that's because He wants us to be able to, to get closer to Him as well. So it means that if a person wants to succeed in understanding the messages that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending us on a daily basis, we need to learn, learn how to reframe the picture that we are seeing. Not to see things as negative, which is the natural way in which a person looks at things, but rather a person needs to look at things in a different light, with a different set of glasses, with a different view, because if I look at it in the right way and not the wrong way, I won't hate another person in my heart. I won't want to take revenge. I won't bear this grudge for years and years and years and years what they did because I'll realize everything that was sent to me was sent by the Rebbeinah She'olam for a reason and a purpose. And I am to use that reason and purpose to grow in this world as well. I want to leave you off with a story. It's not specifically about this, but it's the idea of reframing the way that we look at the events that are taking place in our life. About uh, 20, no, 30 years ago, Rav Zelik Pliskin, one of the, one of the main rabbim in the ancient Torah and Eretz Yisrael, he wrote a sefer called Gateway to Happiness. And in that book, he goes through from beginning to, to end how a person can find a pathway to joy, to simcha in their life. It's a very wonderful book. Many people's lives have been changed as a result of this book because they realize that you could just keep reframing the situation and instead of letting yourself get drawn down, you'll end up seeing the joy that is there. So in 1987, after the book had become very popular in the Jewish world, Eshitor decided that they're going to make like a Simcha training course one day and they're going to try to, to gather as many, many Jews as they possibly could in Jerusalem to come and learn from the master of happiness himself, Rabbi Pliskin, how to be a happier person. And they advertised for weeks on end, and they sent out, I don't know, emails back then, whatever, but they were posting flyers and sending out mail, and their goal was that all the, the Jews that were living in, uh, that, were, that were either living in the Jewish Americans, the English speakers living in Israel, or the ones that were traveling through Israel, that they should come to this seminar on Simcha. And sure enough, they did a very good job advertising, and they were, they were, they were um, led to the King David Hotel, which is a very nice hotel, and they were there, standing room only crowd, to be able to, be able to learn what it was to be a happy person. And Rabbi Pliskin gave over an amazing, amazing lecture, amazing sheer, and he himself is the, he's like the poster boy for Simcha because he's always smiling, he radiates joy, he's shining like a light, and everybody was very inspired. He told anecdotes, he told stories, he brought rise, all different things, fine. At the end of this year, his favorite part of the class is when he opens up the floor for comments and for questions, he likes to hear what other people have to say. So he says, over at this point, he says, now that I finished my part, now it's time for your part. If anybody has any questions, any comments that they like to share, please, the floor is all yours. Before he even finishes speaking, there's a man raising his hand, and he says, yeah, please, tell me. So the guy gets up, and he's a middle-aged man, bald, and uh, with a southern drawl from down south someplace. And he stands up, and he says, Rabbi. And he says, how could you say that everything that happens to a person is supposed to be besimcha, you're supposed to be happy? There are many things that happen in a person's life. You can't find the happiness in there. 
And he says, Rabbi, like I'll give you the example. What if you're driving on the road in the middle of the night and it's a dark night, you're all by yourself, you suddenly get a flat tire and you're there stranded by yourself. Tell me, Rabbi, how are you supposed to find the happiness and the joy in that? Silence in the room. Rabbi Pliska is not sure exactly what to answer at that point. And the conversation starts, ensues amongst all the people that are there. They say, yeah, how could it be? How could it be? Suddenly the man sitting right next to this person raises his hand and says, Rabbi, could I, could I give an answer? Rabbi Pliska says, okay, please. So the man stands up, he introduces himself, his name is Alan, and he says, several years ago, I was in very, very bad physical shape and health. I went to the doctor, I was having a hard time breathing, my heart wasn't beating as well as it could have, I kept getting sick on and off. The doctor ran his test, he looked at me and he says, Alan, you are a time bomb that is waiting to explode. And if you don't change your way of life today, I'm sorry to tell you, but I don't think you're going to be around next year. You need to go on a diet. You need to start doing some light exercise. You work very hard. You're a lawyer, you're a workaholic. You have to cut down on your hours. Stop going to the office so much. You cannot do any strenuous exercise. I'm telling you, your heart's going to explode. You have to take care of yourself. You have to eat right. You have to gentle, ex light exercise, sleep enough, and take the stress out of your life. Otherwise, I don't know what your future is going to bring. So the man's telling the story to the captive audience. He says, my doctor I know for 20 years. He's not a man that exaggerates ever. And if he said that that's where I was holding in my life, I got very nervous. And so, following the doctor's instructions, I listened to everything that he said. And for the next year, I worked on my diet. I worked on the stress. I worked on the sleeping. I didn't go to work as much as I used to. I was doing light calisthenics and exercise to make sure that my heart was pumping the right way. And I didn't do anything strenuous that could hurt myself. At the end of a year, I come back to the doctor. And when he walks into the room and he sees me 60 pounds lighter, energy, looking good, he didn't even recognize me. He said, Alan, you did it. You did it unbelievably. He runs all the blood tests, the EKG, everything. And lo and behold, I'd he I was healed. Healthy as could be. And he told me, the doctor said, I'm happy to tell you, Alan, you can go back to living your life much more normal than you, than you have the last year. Don't go overboard. Don't start stressing yourself out. Don't miss out on the sleep. But if you want to start going back to work more, he says you want to start eating some of the foods that you weren't eating before. You want to even get involved with heavy exercise once again. Like for example, changing the tire of a car. You can do that as well. So I said, thank you doctor. And he sent me on my way. Two nights later, my wife and I are driving down a highway late at night, and it's pouring rain, and we're the only people on the road. And suddenly I hear, Pow! and the car starts going like this, and I realize that my tire blew. And I managed to get over to the side of the road, and the rain is coming down, and it's dark as can be, and I look at the tire, and I start crying. Not, cause, not crying tears of sadness, but rather tears of joy, because I remembered the words of the doctor who said, Alan, you're so healthy now that if you'd want to change a tire, you could change a tire for yourself. And there in the late night, in the dark, on the side of the road, as the rain is pouring down on me, with tears in my eyes the entire time and gratitude and happiness, I changed that tire. I got wet and dirty and filthy. But I did it with joy because it was a sign of my health and I'm no longer sick. So he turns to the man, he says, so you see, even changing a tire could be one of the happiest moments of your life. And at that moment, everybody in the room heard loud and clear that simcha is not what happens to you, simcha is how you deal and you see the events that are in front of you. So too, David HaMelech is saying, it's my success in this world is not on how much goodness HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends my way. My success in this world is how I deal with every situation that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends my way. 
And if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is putting me through nisyonis, challenges and pain and suffering and the like, no, again, nobody had it more than David HaMelech. If I look at it as a way to get closer to the Rebbe Nishalom, then I realize from this situation of hardship, I'm going to grow and I'm going to reach a greater level of the Vekas of closeness with Hashem. And if we do that, as it writes over here, that's the real bitachin, the real trust that a person will have in HaKadosh Baruch Hu is because Hashem will be the one that will give us a matan as a gift. He's going to send you that ability to have a real kesha, a real relationship, a real love, and a real belief, and a real trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And in that schus, whatever will happen, it won't be viewed as bad. It will be viewed as a gift that HaKadosh Baruch is sending me to help make myself a better person and get closer to Hashem. Have a wonderful week, everyone.